Well, good morning, everybody. So today, um, over the next couple weeks, we're going to be beginning a brand new series called Jesus and Miracle Work, where we're going to look into um, some, some miracles that Jesus performed. And I love the miracles because it shows how Jesus, while on earth, is God, and he had the power of God while he worked on earth. So it, it clearly shows that Jesus is God. Before we begin, though, there's a picture here I want to show you guys. How many people on Facebook or Instagram have ever seen something like this? It says, say this slow, God, I love you and I need you now. If you, if you meant it, repost it and a miracle will happen tonight. Ignore and all will go wrong. How many people have seen something like this before? Okay, good. Well, this is not what we're talking about today. We are not talking about this. And um, if you have posted something like this, uh, please stop. Because it does nothing for Christianity, it does nothing for Jesus, and um, this is not God ordained at all. And you know, um, I, I like that last line too. And all will go wrong. So if you don't post it, um, everything is going to be worse than it was, even if you would have never read it to begin with. So it, it's just silly. But today we're going to be looking at miracles. Um, C.S. Lewis defines a miracle as an interference with nature by supernatural power. Interference with nature by supernatural power. And that's a good definition, but I like this one from Relevant Magazine. It says this, we shouldn't think in terms of strict supernatural, natural divide. According to scripture, God is just as responsible for the ordinary process of nature as he is for any miracle. From how the sparrow flies to how the lion eats. Nature is not the composition of law-like patterns occurring independently of God. And thus, miracles are not cases of when God intervenes, but when he acts differently than usual for his redemptive purpose. So this is saying that God is continually working. A miracle isn't necessarily God working because God is continually working. He's holding the world up right now. He's holding all life together. And that is, in a sense, a miracle, but it is also one of his natural laws. But a miracle, according to this definition, is when he acts differently from those, those natural laws that he has created. And it's incredible, because if you think about it, God has the power to do whatever he wants, right? If he wanted to, if he wanted to, he could take all the air in this room and turn it into water. He has the power, the ability to take a chemical composition and turn it to something completely different. Now, people can't do that, but he has that ability to do this. In the Bible, he turned water into wine, he makes the blind see, and he brings the dead to life. Like, that's, that blows my mind. We hear that in church a lot. He brings the dead to life. But he actually took a dead person and brought him back to life. That is absolutely incredible. So we're going to look into uh, one of the miracles. The first miracle today is John chapter 5. If you have your Bibles, please turn there. We're going to be reading from the ESV version. Give you about 15 seconds to turn there. And it says this, John 5, verses 1 through 9. After this, there was a feast of the Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. So Jesus is on the scene right now. Verse 2. Now there is in Jerusalem by the sheep gate a pool in Aramaic called Bethesda, which actually means house of mercy, and that's very appropriate because Jesus is on the scene and he is very merciful. So it's very appropriate that he is in the house of mercy which has five roof colonnades. And I, 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 there's a picture right now, and this is an actual picture of, of that, uh, the, the pool that was there 2,000 years, ago, 2,000 years ago. So I like seeing these things because Jesus actually walked there. He actually, he, he actually healed this lame man at this very place. This is really neat to see that they, they actually are finding these places. Verse 3. In these lay a multitude of invalids, blind, lame, and paralyzed. And if you notice, um, it goes from verse 3 to verse 5. Does anyone else's Bibles do that? Does anyone's Bibles have verse 4? Well, the earliest manuscripts didn't have that, so they eventually took it out. But verse 4 would eventually say, or does say, that a river would run underneath this pool. And every time it bubbled up, people would believe that it would have some sort of healing properties. So uh, blind, the lame, um, if anybody with an infirmity would sit around this pool, and if it bubbled up, they would jump into the pool, and they believed the first person into that pool would be healed. 
So it was kind of a myth going on, and that's why all these people are laying around this pool. They're not sunbathing. They're not doing anything like this. They have a real problem, and they need to be healed, and they want that bubble to come up out of the water and to find healing. Verse 5. One man was there who had been an invalid for 38 years. When Jesus saw him lying there and knew that he had already been there a long time, he said to him, Do you want to be healed? The sick man answered him, Sir, I have no one to put me into the pool when the water is stirred up while I'm going, to, while I'm going down another step down before me. Jesus called to him, Get up, take up your bed, and walk. At once the man was healed, and he took up his bed and walked. walked. Now that day was a Sabbath. So we're going to take apart this verse, uh, uh, these verses a uh, little bit at a time, and we're going to get some big truths out of it. So the big truth number one is that humanity is broken. And if you're following along in your bulletin, you can write down in the blanks, humanity is broken. In these, verse 3, lay a multitude of invalids, blind, lame, and paralyzed. I want you guys to picture what was going on here. I want you guys to picture who was there, what was happening. I want you to smell what was going on there. It is desperation city there. There are people who want to be healed, who need to be healed, and they are waiting. They are desperate to be healed. They're waiting for that water to bubble up so they can jump in the water and be healed. But, of course, this was a myth, and I believe Jesus knew this was a myth. But just imagine the scene going on here. If you've ever been to a hospital or a nursing home, uh, you would see maybe a sad scene like this, maybe down an intensive care unit at a hospital. You see people who, who just need to be healed, who just need to be fixed, and this brokenness going on. And we don't have to look too far to see that there's something wrong with the world. There's something wrong with them, and there's something wrong with us today. I got a list of tragedies that have happened um, just this year. Just check that out. This is just like the big ones that's happened since 2017 all around. You have all those, and there are big things going on there. You don't have to look too far to realize that the world is broken. Just for fun, I went to a random uh, news site, Channel 9 News. I just picked it randomly in my head, and I took a screenshot. And on this screenshot, I decided to look of how many bad news stories there were. And then I highlighted them on my piece of paper right here. And I count one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Eight bad news stories. Just when you first immediately look at the page. I didn't scroll down. I didn't search. I went to the page, the main page. I took a screenshot, and that's what you got. It talks about the young man who was killed a couple miles from our church. It talks about fire destroying a home. And it talks about on the very bottom, if you can see it, Cincinnati ranks among the worst American cities. I don't know where they got that, but, you know, it's, you know, bad news, man. If you've ever been to a funeral, you know that when somebody dies, if you're close to them, or um, if you're, when you're at a funeral and you're witnessing the family going through these struggles and the pain, you realize that something deep down inside of you says, you know what, this isn't right. Something is not right here. And it's not. Something is not right here. Something is broken. We don't have to look too far to realize that there's something wrong with us either. Romans 3.23 says, For all sin and fall short of the glory of God. Other translations say we fall short of God's glorious standard. What is his glorious standard? It is perfection. We fall short of God's perfection. And what is the result of that? Romans 6.23 for the wages of sin is death. We are condemned to death because we are broken people. Ephesians 2, 1 through 3 says this, And you were dead in the trespasses and sins. It doesn't say we were bad. It doesn't say that we had a behavior problem. It says that sin has made us dead. All right? That can't be fixed by behavior modification. Death cannot be fixed by fixing a behavior. Verse 2. In which you were... In what, in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and in the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. So we learn from this verse that, that, that we were dead, and we are just like the rest of the mankind. We are all spiritually dead. We don't have to look too far to realize without Jesus we are broken, even if we don't know it. There are billions of people right now who are broken, who are spiritually broken, and they don't know it. 
I once had a car, and I tried to find a picture of this car, but I couldn't find one going back. I could have got a stock image, but it wouldn't have been the same. I had a 1995 Pontiac Sunfire when I was in college. Does anybody know what this cars look like? Ugly. Um, <laughs> This car was awful. It had dents in it. Um, it had tinted windows. The, the window tint was peeling off on it. Um, and by the time I got rid of the car, by the time I would sell the car, it would have 260,000 miles on it. The car was worn really, really bad. But the car had many problems throughout my whole college, my whole college experience. One problem was the air conditioning went out, and I didn't get it fixed for two years. So I went two years without air conditioning. That was great. Um, and then another time, uh, has anybody struts ever went out in their car? Well, apparently my struts, it's what, it, it's what takes the shock of the car. My struts had gone out, and they are always out when I bought the car. So I drove the car like five years with the struts being out, and everywhere I went, the car would shake violently, all right? At, like if you went up a hill that was a little bumpy, it would turn those bumps in magnified times a thousand. Going to Heather's house, um, when we were dating, it was up this hill, and it was a very bumpy hill. And one time, she actually, I, I, I think, she didn't break her ankle, but she kind of tore a ligament or something. And I had to drive her home. I drove up this road, and the car was shaking. She was yelling at me to slow down. Um, it, and then finally, finally, I had, to, I had to pay the money and get the struts fixed. Once I got the struts fit, fixed, the car drove smooth as can be. I never realized how the car was supposed to drive until it was fixed. And just like Jesus, we don't really know how our life is supposed to be until we know Jesus. We don't have to look too far to realize that Jesus is near. In this scene, we are all the blind, we are all the invalids, we are all the people around the pool needing healing. We are all spiritually dead. Psalm 34, 18 says, For the Lord is near to the brokenhearted and saves the crushed in spirit. And that is true for those around the pool that day, and that is true for us today. It brings us to truth number two. Spiritual healing is avail available. Spiritual healing is available. Verse 5. One man was there who had been an invalid for 38 years. Imagine this, guys. Imagine 38 years. I'm 32, so this would be eight more years than I've been alive that this guy was an invalid, right? That is absolutely crazy. Basically, his whole life, probably, he had been able to... I, we're not sure if he was paralyzed or if he was able to move a little bit, but when you're not able to move or you're paralyzed, you get this thing called muscle atrophy. Has, that, has anybody ever witnessed this or seen somebody with muscle atrophy? It's not a pretty thing. But what happens is when you don't use your muscles, they begin to deteriorate. And if you're laying in the bed, if you're laying in a spot for too long, the muscle will begin to deteriorate and you won't be able to use it. It'll become very weak. I would imagine that this man had some sort of physical muscle atrophy going on. We don't know exactly what was wrong with him, but I would imagine that he did. And just as muscle atrophy set in for this man, spiritual atrophy can set in for us. We are meant to move spiritually. Paul compares living with Jesus. He compares this living, this Christianity thing we do, a race. He doesn't say we're supposed to sit here and experience it all. He says we we're supposed to run the race. 1 Corinthians 9.24 and Hebrews 12.1 both tell us to run the race. When I ran track in high school, you would practice, right? I remember the first couple of days of practice would be brutal. They, they make you, I run long distance, so they, the first days of practice, they would say, all right, we want you to start out by running two or three miles. And we would run two or three miles, and then the next morning you wake up and you'd be so sore. You don't realize how many muscles you have in your body until every single one of them hurts with excruciating pain. But the point of it is we build up those muscles to run the race, and we need to build up our spiritual muscles to run the race that Jesus has set for us. So has spiritual atrophy set in for you? So how do you know? I, I, I came up with four ways that you might know spiritual atrophy has set in for you. Uh, number one, you're not reading your Bible. Uh, this is a big one. I say this, I think, every time I preach. Um, but you're not reading your Bible. You have stopped reading your Bible. You stop trying to encounter God in a real way through his word. Number two, you don't want to be around other believers in the church. You don't think that it's necessary to be around the people at church. So you isolate yourselves and you stay home or... Um, 
I don't know, you, you just don't come to church anymore. You don't want to be around other people. Number three, you're less thankful in your life. In your daily life, you're not thankful for what God has done, and you start to, you know, not thanking God for what he's doing, and you start to realize that um, maybe God is not working you, or you think God's not working in your life. And number four, maybe a negativity has set in in your life. Um, maybe you fail to see the positive in life. Maybe you fail to see the good things in life that God is actually doing. In a book, Why Churches Die, um, I, there's this quote here. I don't have the quote, but I have the book cover up here. And uh, the author says this. Like the Israelites, Christians learn that manna, which was fresh and nutritious yesterday, becomes moldy to you today. Each and every day must be marked with fresh, a fresh confrontation with the Lord. And the sad fact is, however, that moldy manna is an acquired taste for too many of us. We become complacent with our daily walk with God. Muscles that once, at, uh, muscles that once at a time were pulsing with power have weathered towards atrophy. We no longer have muscles we once had. We become a shadow of our former selves. So we are meant to run. We are meant to strive the race that Jesus has set, uh, set ahead of us. Verse 6. When Jesus saw him lying there and knew, I like this, I like this. When Jesus had saw him lying there and knew that he had been there for 38 years, that's a, this is like a big God moment here because, you know, God knew that this man had been here for 38 years. He probably saw him when he was born. He probably saw him. He was thinking about this guy before the world was even created. Jesus knew that he had been here for 38 years. He said Jesus knew he'd been here a long time. He said to him, do you want to be healed? This may seem like an obvious question, right? Do you want to be healed? Of course I want to be healed. But it's more of a real profound question Jesus is asking. He's really asking, do you want spiritual healing here? And he's asking you this question today. Do you want spiritual healing? Do you want to be well? Do you want to get rid of the sin in your life? If we are honest with ourselves, the answer for many of us might be no. Do you truly want to look like Jesus? Throughout your day, when you go to work, do you want to look like Jesus? When you drive, do you want to look like Jesus? Because the more we look like Jesus, the less we will fit into this world. You guys realize that, right? Because Jesus didn't fit into this world too good. You read the Bible. The more we look like him, the less we are going to fit in at work, the less we're going to fit in at school, and the less we're going to fit in everywhere. Are you willing to take that risk? Hopefully the answer is yes today. The next truth. Following Jesus always comes at a cost. And these, kind of, these last truths kind of relate to each other. Following Jesus always comes at a cost. Healing for this man would have cost him something. When Jesus came up to him and healed him, it would have meant that he could no longer beg for money. It would have meant that he would, people would no longer give him money. What it meant for him, healing meant life change. His life would have been completely flipped upside down. He would have been laying there for 38 years, never had to work, never had to do anything to receive the money. He was obviously living in and getting food some way. But healing meant that he would have to do everything himself. And when we are spiritually healed, it means that we need to count that cost. It means life change for us, right? When we give our lives to Jesus, that means our lives must change. Uh, turn your Bibles to Luke chapter 14 for me. And this is not going to be up on the screen. Um, so if you have your Bible, turn there. Luke 14, verses 25 through 33. And this is Jesus telling them there and in turn telling us to count the cost. Now a great crowd accompanying him and turned and said to them, and he turned and said to them, If anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, and yes, even his own life cannot be my disciple. Whoever does not bear his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. Now, is this, like, without reading in the context of this, it does seem like Jesus wants us to hate other people, but that's not what this verse is saying here. He's saying, in comparison to me, your love for Jesus must be the top and utmost priority. You can take a treasure test to see if this is you. If you were to lose everything in life, if you were to lose your house, your car, everything you've bought, 
and you couldn't get it back with insurance and you were just, it would be gone completely. Could you be satisfied? Not happy, but could you be completely satisfied in knowing that Jesus is all you have left? If not, then this verse may be for you. Verse 28. For which of you desiring, desiring to build a tower does not first sit down and count the cost. There it is, count the cost. Whether he has enough to complete it. Otherwise, when he has laid the foundation and is not able to finish, all who see it begin to mock him, saying, This man began to build this build and was not able to finish. Verse 31. Or what king, going to encounter another king in a war, will not sit down first and deliberate whether he is able with 10,000 men to meet him who comes against him with 20,000? And if not, while the other is yet a great way off, he sends delegation and asks for terms of peace. So therefore, any of you who does not renounce all he has cannot be my disciple. Jesus is telling us, if we're going to be his disciple, if we're going to be his followers, we must count the cost. We must count the cost in our daily lives, in our work, in our school, whatever they might be. So what does it mean for us to count the cost today? I came up with a couple things. Number one, it might mean we need to make a commitment of service. This week, we have an incredible opportunity for service, Vacation Bible School. And there are already probably 20 or 30 volunteers, and that's awesome. But what if everybody in this room volunteered in some way for Vacation Bible School? Maybe, you know, kids aren't really your thing. Maybe you want to serve. Maybe you can sing. Maybe you can play an instrument up here. Maybe teenagers are your thing. They're not for everybody. I get it. Um, you know, they can, be, they can be something sometimes. But I love doing it. I love them. Um, but maybe you want to serve in the youth ministry. Maybe you want to serve in the kitchen. Maybe you want to serve somewhere in the church. Maybe you need to make a commitment of service today. Maybe that's the cost for you. Maybe you need to take, take a public stand for Jesus. Maybe when you're at work or when you're at school or when you're out in public, nobody would know by looking at you that you follow Jesus. Maybe you need to let other people know publicly that you follow Jesus. Maybe you need to sacrifice something in your life. Maybe there's something that needs to go or something that needs to come into your life. Maybe you need to start doing something that God is prompting you to do. Maybe you need to stop doing something that God is telling you to stop doing. What is the cost for you? Because if we really think about it, every great accomplishment in life, every single one, every single great thing you're going to do comes at a cost. Musical instruments. How many hours of work do people put into musical instruments? In, in, I, I, can I ask you a question? How many hours would you say it took you to learn to play the drums like you did? Like, uh, 10,000 10, hours. Yeah, 10,000 10, hours. Yeah, so, so Connor, before he played the drum, he had to realize that he needed to count the cost, that he was going to have to put in this many hours to be able to play the way he does. Any type of instrument you play, you have to count the cost whether or not you're going to want to put in the hours required to do it good. Um, is there anybody in here who's run a marathon before? Nobody? Okay. I know my wife, Heather, wants to run one one day. <laughs> no, she says. But... If anybody wants to run a marathon, they have to put in countless hours and countless miles in order to get up to be able to run that 26 point, was it 26.2, two miles? Um, you have to put in the time. You have to really, you have to count the cost of what it's going to be. When we give our life to Jesus, we must count the cost. He wants to be part of your entire life. He just doesn't want to be a part when you're here at church for an hour. He wants to be a part when you're at work. He wants to be a part of your life. When you're in school, he wants to be a part of every single aspect of your life. Next truth. We cannot heal ourselves. Verse 7 says, A sick man answered him, Sir, I have no one to put me into the pool, and the water is stirred up. And while I'm going down, another steps down before me. We simply cannot get to God on our own. We cannot even rely on other people. This guy was trying to rely on himself one. He probably tried to get into a pool, hit the pool himself. And then he says he was relying on other people, and he couldn't even rely on other people to get him to this. And with the amount of self-help books out there, it's obvious that people want some sort of healing. I got some self-help statistics here, um, and check these out. Public seminars are worth 400 to 500 million dollars. It's a 400 to 500 million dollar business. Self-help. The book industry for self-help is estimated to be worth 1.3 billion dollars. 
So there are people out there who want healing, who want to get better, right? The industry is still growing even when it is hit by a recession. Over 13 million relationship self-help books are sold, were sold in 2007. And I thought this one was funny. Men rarely buy into self-help. Um, that's, that's because men think that they don't need it. They can do it on their own, you know. I get it. And ABC News wrote an article, Want to Get Rich? Write a Self-Help Book. So it's obvious that people are out there, they want to be healed, they want to get better. When they look into the mirror, they do not like who they see, and the only one who's really going to fix that problem is Jesus. We can work on ourselves left and right all day for hours and hours, but ultimately to, to fix the spiritual problem that is inside of us, we need Jesus. There's a picture here. I like this picture. Is this man, um, if you can see it, is Jesus on one side, the lamb man in the middle, and then the pool on the other side. I, I, I don't know why I liked it so much, but on one side of them is Jesus, something that's real, something that's relevant. On the other side of them is the pool, which is a myth, which is fake. This man is standing between something that is real and something that is fake. And we are all standing between something that is real and something that is fake. We all have the opportunity, have the choice to choose Jesus or to go to the pool of whatever it is we think is going to help us or we think that is going to make us better. So which way would you go? Would you go towards Jesus or would you go to the pool? Ephesians 2, 4 through 10 says this, um, and this is continuing the verse that talks about we were dead. Um, this is the other part of that. But God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places with Christ Jesus, so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. There's the key word. This is, not, this is nothing you guys did. This is not you going to your pool. This is not you trying to step down to the pool. It's Jesus saying, get up. It's Jesus' words healing. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for the good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. I love that verse. Verse 8 continues like this. Jesus said to him, Get up, take your bed, and walk. And at once the man was healed, and he took up his bed and walked. Now that day was the Sabbath. I want you to imagine for one second what the man felt like. When I sleep, I must sleep in... I must sleep really weird because sometimes I wake up and both my arms will be asleep, both my legs will be asleep. One time I woke up, both my arms and both my legs were dead asleep and I was laying on my stomach and I couldn't turn over. So I had to wibble wobble my torso to finally get over. But that feeling when, when your muscles actually start getting blood back to them is absolutely incredible, isn't it? Your arms start tingling. I want you guys to picture this, what this man might have felt. He probably never knew what it was to really walk. And then he started feeling his muscles change. Some tingling come to his legs, some feeling come to his legs. All because Jesus said, get up. Didn't even touch him. He says, get up and walk. The man had complete physical renewal. renewal. And we can have complete spiritual renewal today. Which brings us to our last big idea of this verse. We serve the same God today. That same God who healed this man 2,000 years ago at that pool, we serve today. He is the same exact one. But Jesus answered them, My Father is working until now, and I am working. Hebrews 18, or 13, 8 says, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. For many of us, physical a physical miracle might never happen. But a spiritual miracle can. The miracle of Jesus saving us from our sins. Let's pray. God, thank you 
for Jesus Christ. Thank you for the amazing power, life-changing power that he has offered us. If there's anybody in here who, who needs healing, who needs that spiritual healing from, from their sin, I pray that, that you would prompt them to talk to somebody today. And again, thank you for Jesus. Thank you for the cross. Thank you for what you did. It's in his name we pray. Amen.